keynote speaker, John Elder Robeson. John is a valued and integral member of our campus community. He uh, is very, very visible on our campus, engaging in a whole host of events, meeting with students, faculty, and staff. John is in, highly involved with our social pragmatics uh, student group, working with Andy Donahue and his team. He engages in our career connections work, working uh, with Jan Copeland uh, and career connection staff, as well as working with our entrepreneurship program, working with uh, Tamara Sten uh, as part of Entrepreneurship Day, which will be happening in a couple weeks. Uh, John Elder Robeson is a visiting lecturer and advisor to the Landmark College Center for Neurodiversity. John is an autistic leader in the neurodiversity movement who teaches, writes, and consults about autism and neurodiversity. His interests include autism research, policy, uh, effects of neurodiversity on behavior, and better services for students uh, who are autistic and their families. He's a strategist and advisor to the Autism at Work Initiative, by which corporations gain competitive advantage by employing autistic people. For roughly 15 years, John has advised the United States government on autism strategy, neurodiversity in our national labs, and understanding autism in the federal courts. A celebrated author, John has published multiple books including Look Me in the Eye, My Life with Asperger's, and Switched On, a memoir of brain change and emotional awakening. As I mentioned at Landmark College, John has been an active member of the campus community. He provides presentations, meetings, consultations with students, and general advice uh, to the campus community. Uh, if you have interest in John's further events for this year, because he is around for the entire year as he has been for the last few, um, students are welcome to reach out to me at Adam Laylor, A-D-A-M-L-A-L-O-R, at landmark.edu, and I'll be happy to uh, tell them all the additional events that John will be involved in. John will also be publicized in our uh, various posters around campus, so students should have uh, the, the word fast and quickly. So without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming today's keynote presenter, the incomparable John Elder Robeson. So, okay. I guess it's better for this social distancing business. Um, anyway, um, Adam told you that you can write uh, you can write him, but you can also write me directly. You can uh, can, can parents, think parents can look up email addresses at Landmark, right, for the students, and students, you can look up, yeah, so I'm, you know, John Robeson at, at Landmark also, you can, you can just look online and, and find me, you can write me directly, um, but uh, Adam knows the whole schedule because he is the, um, kind of the keeper of the schedule of all of the events that we do, so he'll be able to tell you. Um, students... I would encourage you to come to the social pragmatics evenings that we have. We, we used to, before the pandemic, have a table in the cafeteria, and we would start there, and, um, and then we would go into uh, just one of the rooms next to the cafeteria and talk. I don't know if we'll be able to do that this year. I guess it'll depend on the situation, if we can be at a table together. I, I guess we'll, we'll have to see. But um, the thing that is really important about these social pragmatics evenings is that those of you who are students, you went through a dozen years of grade school and high school with teachers who were supposed to be knowledgeable people telling you how to be normal. But they weren't telling you how to be normal. They were telling you how to act in their imagined normal. Because for us, there's hundreds of us here and the way we are is our normal, and it always will be. So the thing that is vital 
is that you unlearn some of the stuff people told you. When people told you that you were stupid, you were lazy, you, you, were, you were weird, or you were abnormal, or you, learned, you needed to learn how to behave like everyone else, this is what we are. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't learn good manners. I'm not telling you you shouldn't learn how to behave so that other people will like you. That's a universal statement. Every human benefits from those things. I'm telling you, though, that people with autism, ADHD, dyslexia, PDD-NOS, we, we don't perceive the world like people who don't have those attributes. Because we don't see the world that way, we don't respond the way people who aren't like us would respond. And that causes people who aren't like us to think that we are weird. Just as we look at those people and we think that they are weird. This goes both ways. And what's totally unique about Landmark is that a large fraction of the faculty and staff here, probably most visibly represented by me, but I'm by far not, I'm far from the only one, we are people who are here because we are different. And we believe in helping teach folks like you not how to be normal, but how to be successful living as our normal. Because it's our normal that we're always going to be, not someone else's. We want to help you learn how to be like you are, like I am as successful older adults. And that is fundamentally different from what you heard from non-autistic, non-ADHD, and so on, counselors that you heard from in school. Here, nobody is going to tell you that you're stupid or lazy or weird, because we're all stupid, lazy, and weird, and all the other shit they said to us together. We are all that way. But in addition to being that way, we have exceptionalities that most of those other people who were critical of us do not possess. And what you're going to discover, because you're reaching the age, we're going to learn these things, you're going to see that that is why people like us exist in the world. We do not act as we do, think as we do, behave as we do, because of a conscious choice. Some of you identify as LGBT. Well, there's whole more letters after that, but you get the idea. Some of you identify as non-standard in that respect. But again, for you, the way you are is your normal. It is your standard. It is not wrong. But really what's very important, and they don't talk about this much when talking about gender and sexual identity, they say it's not a personal choice. We're born this way. And they say that as if those words are all that need be said. We were born this way. Just as you might be tall, you might be short, you might be thin. But there's more to it than that. Because you've you got to ask yourself, well, if we're born this way, why are we born this way? We're born this way because of evolution. So the reason people who are different in that way exist in the world is that having those people in our population provides a competitive advantage to our species. Not necessarily to the individual, but to our species as a whole. That is probably the most long-standing visible example of neurological diversity. If we are born that way, it is a difference in our brains. Because sexuality and gender are things, in, they're in our minds. 
What's less visible are all these other forms, which are the principal things that bring us to school. Dyslexia, for example. You're told in grade school that you can't read. Or if your parents here in the audience, like I heard, my son's teacher said when he was seven years old, if he can't read by now, he's probably never going to learn to read. And, and you probably found that very disheartening if you heard that kind of thing. And, and if you were the kid who was told that thing, it was pretty disturbing too. But in fact, dyslexia isn't about reading. Dyslexia is about looking at stuff you see. Whether it's looking at all of you in the seats, or looking at this text on the page, or looking at stars in the sky. Dyslexia is about looking at an image field and processing it in a different way than most people process it. So written words evolved thousands of years ago, and the manner of putting those words on a paper, a papyrus, a stone, that manner evolved in the way that was most acceptable to the majority of people. Some of us processed visual input in a different way, so that the way that was most accessible to most people was not very accessible to us. And for thousands of years, nobody had a word for that because it didn't matter. For most of human history, only a small number of people read or wrote printed language. Instead, people used their eyes for all sorts of different and more practical things. Some herded sheep. Some were blacksmiths. Some were ministers. Some were traders. And they all looked at the things in their life and they conducted their affairs. As most of you who are old enough to have grown up with dyslexia know, dyslexia does not present any disability whatsoever in doing any of those things I described to you. People with dyslexia who may instinctively take in the pattern of information on this screen, and they may instinctively take away a message that's different from what a non-dyslexic person would have intended when they put that up there. And that is the key advantage to our species that causes dyslexia to persist in humanity. Because people who see things differently will be the people who may be able to pick the one critical difference out in a visual field that is vital to our survival. Thousands of years ago, if you were crossing the oceans, and you had to look up in the sky and try and discern where you were by looking at relationships between stars? Might it be a person with dyslexia who took in that visual field? And to him, maybe in today's world, he'd, he wouldn't be able to read. But in that world, where he took in the visual field and looking at those stars, and imagining that this one was here when he was at home, and now it's here, and that means he is moving away or moving towards his destination. But it's not as simple as just saying this star is here and that star is here. It involves looking at the thousands of stars that we can see when we look up into the sky and saying the pattern has shifted, and the pattern has shifted in a way that tells me that I'm moving away or towards my home. And if I'm moving away from my home and I want to go to my home, I need to turn in this direction. 
So might it be that dyslexia exists today because it made celestial navigation possible before there was any instrumentation or any mechanical device to assist in it. Now take autism. People with autism, when you're in school like me, they say again, he's stupid. Not only is he stupid, but he's defiant because he won't do his classes. All he does is study this thing that he's interested in. So you're a six-year-old boy, and all you want to do is learn about stars and planets and astronomy. And when you're six, you're looking at the big books with pretty pictures, and you're looking at the planets and the stars and stuff, and yes. Yes, he, he, right, so he's rightly pointed out that I said, imagining being a boy with autism in school, because I was a boy with autism in school. But to be fair, there are probably just as many girls in school with autism as boys. So bear in mind, when you, when you hear me say, as a boy in school or as a boy this or that, that doesn't mean that if you're not a boy that this does not apply to you. All this neurodiversity stuff applies generally equally to everyone. Anyway, if you were only focused on that one thing, you were a disabled student because the school wanted you to go to social studies and math and, and history and, and English and phys ed. And you don't want to do those things. All you want to do is study astronomy. But when you get into graduate school, your interest in astronomy makes you a very desirable candidate for graduate programs in astronomy. And, and when you graduate from school with your degree, all of a sudden, your fixation on astronomy has gone from being a trait that disabled you at 6, 8, 10, 12 years old to giving you a tremendous advantage in getting work where the degree in astronomy, the knowledge of astronomy, and the instinctive understanding that comes with being immersed in it all your life makes you a really powerful job candidate. And so, might it be that the different ways of perceiving things as a dyslexic person advantaged somebody as a navigator 3,000 years ago? Might it be that the autistic fixations that many of us had that caused some children to look up in the sky, and especially if those children's fathers and mothers were navigators, those children would have learned from a very early age the incredible value of being the person who could read the skies and read the seas to no position. But reading the skies, that's not the whole part of the story. Imagine that your neurological diversity has shown a different side. Maybe you're one of the people, like I was and my son was, who, when you were little, your parents had to cut the labels off your clothing because the clothes, clothes scratched you and bothered you. You, you. you couldn't wear certain kinds of clothing. You only wanted to, to have one thing. Maybe you, you went to school with your stuffed animal because your stuffed animal was was comforting to you, held by the side of your face, and other kids made fun of you as they made fun of me. And, and then people talked about it in clinical terms. They said, 
your child has sensory sensitivities as if that was a bad thing. So why would sensory sensitivities exist today in our population? There's a real clear example of why sensory sensitivity exists. Imagine that the ice age is still upon us. We don't have warm clothes. We don't have modern technology. What we have is an ice sheet, and we have a cold winter, and we have a cave. And some of those caves are inhabited by lions and bears that are significantly more dangerous than the lions and bears today. And if we go in the wrong cave, we will be dinner. So just think about that for a minute. You've got a little group of 10 or 20 people. And if there's half a dozen lions in that cave, you are all going to be dinner. There is no amount of sensory sensitivity that is too much. If you are the person who can step into that cave and you can hear or smell or taste or sense through any means at all, if that cave is safe for you to go into, you are the most important person in the world to your tribe of people, and you always will be. Now, let's go back to that child of the navigators in the South Pacific. It's not enough to be able to look at the stars because the stars can't tell you the direction to nearby land. But what could tell you the direction to nearby land? There are a few things. There are, there are the changes in sea life that occur when you move from deep water to shallow water. But one of the most telling things, and one of the things that the least people know about, is that when waves roll across the deep ocean, and the waves hit the continental shelf, and then they hit the shallow water in an island, the waves are reflected off those undersea structures. And so, if you are a person with sufficient sensory sensitivity, you can lay in the bottom of your boat, and you can feel the change in how the waves hit your boat as you move away or you move toward land or something else underwater. And again, if you are in the middle of a trackless ocean, land is nowhere to be seen. Who is more valuable than the person who can lay in the bottom of the boat and do that? Now, today, doctors and neuroscientists, they say to us, they say to those of you who are parents, well, I'm sorry to tell you that most of these neurological differences go together. I started out telling you about LGBTQ differences. Those are very common. Dyslexia is common. Autism is common. ADHD is common. PDD-NOS is common. They are common together. Almost everyone who is diagnosed with one of those things or who embraces alternate gender or sexual identity or sees in themselves traits of these things we call neurodiversity, almost everyone possesses a group of those traits, not just one, because that package is a package that has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, the entire time modern man has existed. And it has developed for the reasons that I've outlined for you, because those traits which we are criticized for, mocked and bullied today, were the traits that allowed humanity to spread all over the world, and they're the traits that brought us to where we are today. So you might think, what does that have to do with 
the modern world and the workplace, which is what this thing here behind me might lead you to believe that I'm talking about. Well, that was the original workplace for mankind, folks. Work was staying alive and staying fed. So in the modern world, we grow up, we go out, we get a job. I, I worked in electronics. I had a love of music. And uh, many of you who've read my books, you know that I left home and I went out on the road with a local band and I worked for bigger bands and I went to work for a company called Britannia Row, Pink Floyd Sound Company and, and through them I met the folks in KISS and I made a bunch of instruments for them and that stuff was pretty visible to the public and that allowed me to get a job at uh, Milton Bradley designing what became the first handheld video games and some of the first electronic toys that used microprocessors, first talking toys and anyway, all kinds of stuff. But you know, for the first time at Milton Bradley, I found myself in a large workplace. There were hundreds of people in the engineering department there. And because of my neurological differences, I was a really gifted engineer. I know that I can say that today because I can look back on the things that I worked on. And, and there's like whole cult followings for things like Microvision and Big Track and Super Simon and stuff online, the whole communities that still love those things. And, and of course, our, our Microvision that was the first changeable cartridge handheld video game ever. That's the one all the ones you see today are built upon. Play in a guitar that lights up or shoots rockets or does anything like that. I did it first. And, and so I can look back on that and I can think, I can think that people told me that I wasn't a real engineer, I was just a high school dropout that got lucky and all that, but the things I worked on designing speak for themselves. I didn't know that at the time, though. So there I was. My neurological differences gave me gifts I didn't even know I had. When I was working at Milton Bradley, because I was a failure in high school and I wasn't able to make very many friends and people called me ugly names all my life, I assumed that I was a second-rate person, and anything that I did in the realm of engineering could be done better by a real engineer. The only reason that people wanted me to design those guitars was that there was no real engineer who could be bothered to do such a stupid thing for a musician. <laughs> and, and that's really what I believed. And so when I got to Milton Bradley and I was working on these circuits, I thought, you know, after we got a few of these products out the door, I thought, I better quit and get out of here before they fire me, because they're just going to realize I'm just this loser high school dropout, and, and they're going to throw me out, so I better quit while I'm ahead. So I quit. And I went to work for a succession of other companies, and, and what I hadn't really told people about in any of my books, but which is nonetheless true, I took my knowledge of signals, which I had first applied in music, a thing that I loved, and I realized I could apply that to all kinds of other signal processing. I could apply it to the signals on the power lines that carry electricity to the building here. And, and I started making devices to control and protect power systems. And, and in that job, we got a contract from the U.S. government. And, uh, and it was to design power conditioning equipment that would protect test equipment from tremendous surges of electrical energy. If you imagine 
with lightning hitting the roof of this building right now, what they wanted me to design was a system that would allow lightning to hit this building, not just once, but hit it repeatedly while we were all in the room. None of us would feel any ill effects. We would hear the loud boom. I would not be shocked. I could be holding on to these wired devices. There would be no shock. Nothing would happen. Of course, all of you know in real life, if lightning hits the telephone pole outside your house, every electrical device in your home explodes half the time. So they wanted me to design this equipment to survive not lightning strikes, but nuclear blasts. And they wanted me to do it during the time that our country was conducting its last underground nuclear tests. So it was all top secret stuff. And they wouldn't tell me where it was going to be used, wouldn't tell me, you know, what it was for. But of course, it's obvious what it was for, you know, reading what they, what they wanted. However, they said, we're going to, uh, we're going to come out and we're going to do some tests. You know, we'll hire a, a testing lab. They wanted to have me build one of the devices, and they wanted it to be loaded at full power. And you know, this was a device that would power this whole building. They wanted it loaded at full power, hoisted up in the air, and dropped onto concrete while running at full power. It had to not skip a beat. Then they wanted to blast it with simulated lightning and such. It had to, and, and it, it passed all those tests. So they said thank you, and they took it away. And that was the end of it. So a year later, they come back, and they ordered more. And I thought to myself, holy shit, this is the big time. This is the federal government. You know, and not only did I have these government engineering people asking about it, we had the FBI coming to the company, and we had the, some other intelligence service coming to the company to warn us about the secrecy of all this. And I thought, these government people are going to discover that I'm not a real engineer. I'm just this loser, dumb kid, and they're going to put me in prison. <laughs> and so I quit. And, um, and years later, I learned about my neurological differences. I learned I was not stupid. I wasn't second rate. What was most significant is that for the first half of my life, I had been told every day long what I could not do. I was told about how I failed every single day. I was seldom, if ever, told about my gifts. But all of you that are students, you're here because you have the same kind of gifts as me. And you may not even know it, because I'm sure, like me, you were told what was wrong with you just like I was. And, and it was only much later that I learned that most engineers don't have the ability to visualize circuits and signals the way I did. So even though I thought that any engineer could do those things better than me. In fact, very few engineers could do those things at all. And, and after I wrote a book about that, a lot of people from my past came back into my life. I, I heard from musicians I worked with. I heard from people at Milton Bradley. And you know what was most amazing? is the huge number of people that I had worked with who told me, you know, John, I didn't know any of this at the time, but my son or my daughter has just gotten diagnosed with mostly autism, Asperger's, but some tell me about ADHD, some tell me about dyslexia, some Tourette's, all these neurological differences. And, and you know, what I learned is that those of us who became engineers in these places, we were geeks because we were neurodivergent. We were drawn together even with no knowledge of neurodiversity, but we became a neurodivergent community. And so then I heard from the Livermore Lab, which was one of the institutions that hired me to make that stuff long ago. And, um, and the Livermore Lab still has people working there 
who worked on those projects that I designed power systems for. And I designed other, actually I designed other systems later on for Livermore and another company. Um, and uh, that work became the basis for what is uh, now called the National Ignition Facility, which is Livermore's research facility for um, fusion, for nuclear fusion, which is thought by many to be the future of, of power for us. <coughs> anyway, the Livermore lab turns out to be filled with neurodivergent people. And they asked me if I would be their neurodiversity advisor because I had an understanding of what the lab did and what it was like to be different and be there. And I realized that so much of what the lab does with understanding very complex things. I talked to you about waves and music, and it's simple to understand in music. But you know, describing the manipulation of those waves requires a graduate level grasp of calculus and higher mathematics. It's a really complicated thing to do if you want to set it down on paper the way we teach it in school. Now, some people who were critics used to say to me, you can't be a real engineer because you don't know any of that stuff. But you know what? There's a different answer. And it's a true answer, and it applies to many of you in this room. The answer is, I don't need to know that stuff because the calculus lives in me. I can see those waves, and I can add them together in my mind. I can twist them. I can manipulate them. And I can imagine the circuits that will accomplish the changes I want to make, and I can build those circuits, and I may not be able to build them to 10 decimal places of precision like a computer analysis, but I can build them and I can very quickly fine tune them and they will do just what I want them to do. And I don't need any formal training whatsoever in mathematics to do that. Now, some of you may have heard that there are other autistic people Freaks, we are called. And you can say, what day was it? Tuesday, April 12th in the year 1592. I can't do this, but I've met many autistic people who can. And they sit there and they think for a second and they say, whatever, it was a Tuesday. And they're right. And you know what? Many of those people have no education in mathematics whatsoever. A good number of people who have that ability can't even read or write because of their autistic disabilities. And yet, you can ask them a day of the week, a thousand years ago, and they can answer you. Not only that, you can say, how many days was it between two days? And they can answer that. Nobody knows how they do it except to say that that and the manipulation of waves that I described to you proves that many complex technical concepts that we teach in school originated within people like me and you. They live in us. And don't ever forget that. The reason that you may struggle to learn mathematics is not because you are stupid or lazy like people told me, and surely they tell you. The reason is that you may have learned a different system to represent those concepts in your mind than the teachers want to teach you. And it's hard for you to go against your learning to learn to do it differently. And it doesn't just apply to mathematics. When I was in grade school, and then when I was in high school, I failed English miserably because I couldn't understand subjects and, and predicates and, and pronouns and adverbs and adjectives. Even today, I still cannot tell you what the components of a sentence are. But I think it's fair to say, with no disrespect to any known English teacher I ever had, I have gone on to demonstrate a, a greater level of success in written communications all over the world than any of my teachers who told me I was failing ever did. And so do you. 
that's the thing for you to always never, never forget. Because people tell us when we can't do it their way that we're stupid or lazy or defiant. And I'll guarantee you, there's people in here in this room, some of you are parents, some of you are students, and the command of language lives in you. Language did not spring from a textbook into the mind of a caveman who was born with the ability to read. The ability to communicate grew naturally over time. And these things were, in many cases, almost certainly developed by neurodivergent people. Mathematics, calculus as we know it today, English syntax, grammar, those are representational systems that are taught in school to teach people who are not neurodivergent, who were not born with the gift of having that knowledge live within them. That's what those things are for. So don't ever think that your knowledge is second rate. And that is what takes me to neurodiversity in the workplace. We didn't know what neurodiversity was all these years. From thousands of years ago, navigating in the South Pacific, tens of thousands of years ago, our ancestors with the person who could smell the lions and the person who could see the land in the, in the roll of the waves. We didn't have a word for that except those people were our wise men, our wise women, and many of them were our leaders. If they weren't our leaders, they were certainly among the most valuable people in our tribe. And yet, today, we would look at those same people and we would say, they can't read, they can't write, they're dummies, what good are they? That is the shame of this. So, med medical knowledge has given us words to pathologize neurological difference, and that was done with the best of intentions. Doctors said, okay, these kids can't read, these kids can't make friends, and here's why. They have this condition called autism, dyslexia, ADHD, and here's what we can do to develop a therapy to help them. And, and I can't disagree that some therapies that have been developed to help people with dyslexia read, to help people with autism learn social skills, those are valuable and life-changing. But they have come at a cost because we have given a medical label of a disability or a disorder to a condition which occurs naturally in millions of people. We've pathologized the natural, normal way we are. And, and by doing that, we made Teachers think we'll never amount to anything. Just, just a moment, and I'll take questions, okay? And, and we've, we've made employers think, oh, those people are disabled. We'll, we'll do a kindness, and we'll hire some disabled people, not because we think that they're going to be better workers, but because it's the socially conscious thing to do. That's the world in which we grew up. But now, we have this emerging understanding of neurodiversity. And companies, and the Livermore Lab is a perfect example of this. The Livermore Lab came to me not because they said, we want to hire some disabled people to be socially conscious. They said, we want you to help us hire people with different brains because we know that different brains were the minds from which so much of our scientific achievement sprung. And we want you to help us find those people because we are not finding them in regular college programs. The reason we aren't finding them in regular college programs is neurodivergent people in many cases can't complete college. That's why Landmark's here, to teach you the skills to go out and proceed through the next level of education and then proceed into the working world. And this awareness of neurodiversity among colleges, the public, the workplace, that is going to make all of you very, very desirable. And that's a thing that you may not have seen as you were going through grade school, but now, instead of wondering as parents, will my son or daughter be able to get a job? 
you can just look at look around you. Google neurodiversity at work, and hundreds of companies are actively seeking people like us. We are our normal, but we are their exceptional folks. And that's a really different place to be than where we all started as second graders. So I think we have 10 minutes left, and, and I, I hope that I've given you some sense of how our place in the world was and is evolving. Now you have an, a question or comment. Yes. Right, so he's, he's pointing out, she, oh, I'm sorry, she is pointing out. She is pointing out that many therapies that are administered to young children are administered without their consent. And as those young people grow to adulthood, they look back on those therapies with anger and resentment for these things that were forced upon them that they feel now were counterproductive. When I talk about therapies being valuable, I was talking about therapies that you as landmark students will seek out and use willingly. If you go to the counseling center and you say, I'm having trouble figuring out how to organize myself. I can't ever get to class with my right books. I can't get to class with matching socks or, or I'm having trouble making friends. I don't know how to talk to this professor, but we have a problem. If you seek help for those things and the person is able to help you in a way that's constructive, that is a very valuable thing. I'm talking about something that's very different from the controversial and destructive childhood ABA programs. I don't support that either. But, but I do support, especially what we have here at Landmark, which is the idea that if you're a person with ADHD, person with autism, you can talk to a person like you, who's older, who's been down that road, who's solved maybe the same kind of problem that you have solved, and they can talk to you about how they solved it in their life, and you can then say, well, they're like me, maybe that's gonna work for me, and you can go home with some ideas that a person like you used. That's really valuable. Um, let's see, yes, I'll have a bunch of you with questions. Well, well, you're, some of you are applauding and some of you are raising your hands. But let us do, uh, well, yes, what's your question? Well, woof. All right. And, and you had, a, uh, you had a, a question too? Yeah. Or? So, thinking about the workplace, I guess the, the future of work for the neurodiversity community, where do you see, where do you feel like the big shift has happened compared to where you were part of us before as you were growing up in your career? Where do you think that the next big shift needs to happen? The big shift has happened in technology because there are so many aspects of work in like especially electronic technology, software and, and circuit design, where success in those jobs, will, the person who is a very logical, rational, sort of sy systematizing thinker has a huge, huge advantage there. And of course, logic, rationality, systematizing are traits that are very strongly associated with autism. So, there are many more people who have traits of autism working in tech than there are, for example, working in 
ad sales for a television station, because ad sales in a television station requires the ability to go out and uh, and socialize with people and be pals with everyone and you know and be a social butterfly. It's not logical at all. So, so I think that you can imagine what your traits may be as specific neurodivergent individuals, and you can ask yourself, where would that trait give me an advantage? Dyslexia is an interesting thing because dyslexia for many people is only understood in the context of reading disability. But if you look at dyslexia as a different way of interpreting your visual field, and you can then say, well, where would a person who interprets the visual field differently have an advantage? One place for that might be air traffic control. Let's say there are 10 of you that are sitting in a room looking at a similar screen, and one of you is dyslexic. Maybe one of you will be, on occasion, the person who sees a problem before it happens. Now, we have sought to automate traits like dyslexia into AI and computers. So we seek to design computers who look for those aberrations, but they're built upon the concept that dyslexic people could always see them. So much that we do today uses computers and artificial learning to mimic neurodivergent behavior because it's rare. But the thing is, we are always going to be valuable because at least for the next generation, computers can't think this stuff up out of thin air. Computers can do circuit analysis better than you or I could ever do. They can do it more accurately. What they can't do is invent the circuit from nothing. And even when they can invent the circuit from nothing, what they still will not be able to do is imagine that that thing yet to be invented will be useful and valuable. And that's where those of us with different minds are going to have an edge. I've spoken to you in the context of technology, but look at like people like Temple Grandin and other people with neurological differences who are incredibly powerful communicating and understanding animals. So there are many, many places where we can have advantages, but the biggest one in America, I would say right now, is technology. Yes? Yeah, and I couldn't do that either. Yeah, and so public education, I think, especially in the level before places like Landmark, have you ever been reached out by state education departments on how to properly credit special education students who have that difficulty and, and aren't tapped for the real strengths that they have? No, I haven't because they can't do it under the federal education guidelines. I have spoken at many private schools. States, you know, like many states use my books as special ed readers, but to speak to what you just said, um, could a school change to accepting that your child has the right answer even though they cannot show their work? Um, that is... It's a false pretense that schools use to justify their teaching regimen. Because if you can't show the work, you didn't learn to do it the way the teacher wants you to do it. But in fact, it's complete bullshit. Because when you go out in the workplace, nobody cares about showing your work. They want the damn results. <laughs> so. If your son is the one who can see the answer right now, that's what they want. They want the right answer right now. They don't want the answer by the textbook with 10 pages of backup equations to show how he got it. They just want it right. And, and I think that some schools like Montessori embrace that in, in elementary and some high school education. Places like Landmark embrace that because colleges are not subject to the common core standards that, you know, that govern public, public grade schools. But I think we have a long way to go in that. 
However, having said that, if your son can get the right answers, your son's going to always have a significant advantage in life no matter what bullshit his teachers tell him. So, you can see that I don't have a real high opinion, I guess, of the quality of public education in America. And you know, I'll tell you, it's not just because of my lousy experience, it's because I, um, I was living in another town in western Massachusetts. I went to Amherst High School, and they threw me out of Amherst High School when I was um, 16 years old in the, uh, in the 70s. So then when I got my own kid, Cubby, and Cubby got to be high school age, I was living a couple towns away, and I thought, well, we'll move back to Amherst, because Amherst has best, uh, best public schools in western Massachusetts. And wouldn't you know, he goes back there, and he goes to school, and four years later, he drops out of school, too, after they told him he was stupid and lazy and couldn't do this and couldn't do that. And, and you know, things weren't a bit different in Amherst public schools. And, and they've made an effort to change, but now I understand that despite the best wishes of some teachers and the good will and intent of many in the school, the common core standards have really, really harmed a whole generation of people like you and me. Because we can't do what common core demands, because common core is written for the average, and we are not the average. That's what neurodiversity is about. We are different. Yes, enjoying what you do is really important. And, um, and you know, after years of working in technology and not understanding the social dynamics of big companies, I started a business fixing automobiles where I live because I thought it was simpler. And so I just threw all that away. And, um, and today, um, I am... Uh, I used to describe myself as a, um, as a high school dropout because, in, in fact, I was not a high school dropout, I was a high school tossout because Amherst High School removed me. I did not voluntarily remove myself. Um, and, um, and so they told me, I wasn't quite 16, they said, you can't legally drop out of school if you're six, until you're 16, but they said, if you'll go up and you'll pass the GED with at least a 75%, we'll, we'll waive that and we'll let you out of school. And they sent me up to Greenfield Community College. I took the GED and I got a higher score than whatever they wanted me to, to pass. And, um, and they said, okay, fine, you'll, you'll need to pay a fee of $20 to register your grade. I said, what bullshit is that? I'm not going to pay you a fee. You want to get rid of me, and I left. And so, um, so they said, okay, well, you can't have your GED, and you can see how much difference that made to me. Um, but then years later, after I, I wrote these books, and after the state of Texas adopted my books, and there's probably you know, a million Texas public school students who read the things, the State Department of Education down there thought it was shameful for me to be described as a high school dropout, so they gave me an honorary high school diploma, which, as they say, is backed with the full force of law in the state of Texas. So, um, but I think it's more fair to say that I'm a self-educated person. And many of you are going to go on in your lives to become self-educated people, too. Because if you have these neurodivergent traits that make you study things deeply, concentrate deeply, you see things other people can't see, you sense things, you feel things other people you can't feel or sense, you are going to have knowledge that other people don't have. And, and those are the things that set you up to educate yourself about the world. And when you educate yourself about the world, you form your own ideas about the world, not the ideas the textbooks try to teach you. And that is the basis for human innovation. People come up with new things by learning it all themselves. And, and I would suggest to you that every one of you, every neurodivergent person who's here in this school, has the ability to become a self-educated person just as I did. Right now, 
with my appointments at this school, and you know, and I have a, an appointment. I'm the neurodiversity scholar at William and Mary in Virginia. Um, down there at William and Mary, I am, to the best of my knowledge, the only person, the only self-educated person with no formal degrees whatsoever, teaching graduate courses in the sciences in an American university. I'm the only self-educated person who has uh, served on the steering committees to, de to define medical conditions for the world at the World Health Organization and did that as an American representative from the National Institutes of Health, where again, I was the first person to serve on committees to steer autism research policy and public policy around neurodiversity for the federal government. So, I was the first person to do that because I happened to be alive at the dawn of that. Not because I am any different from any of you. You now are growing up in a world where all that stuff is recognized, and now that I did it, I am here to tell you that you can do that too. You are gonna go out, and you're gonna kick ass, and you're gonna take names, and you're gonna push these people, hold you back out of the way, and you are going to do the very same things. You're gonna become self-educated, self-directed, self-driven thought leaders. And that is why neurodivergent people exist in the world. You are the next generation of that. So don't ever forget that. And, and always remember that this is why we are here. And we're here because the world needs us. So I think I'm out of time. So I'll have to say thank you.